Hey guys, my name's Scott Niemeyer and I'm the lead pastor here at High Point Church. I wanna welcome you to our podcast. We hope that you are inspired and encouraged by the word today. Let's jump in and let's get started. We're having, we're having fun uh, in Birmingham, Alabama. So I am not from Alabama. I always use a disclaimer. I'm a Cajun that God actually called on the mission field to Alabama. And uh, because there's nothing, you know, I don't, I don't describe to their sports. Uh, I'm in therapy for my team. Uh, kind of like the Texans, I guess. Come on, somebody, right? We do have some commonality uh, in that. But I was a business person for 35 years. And I never saw how I really fit inside the context of a local church. I knew that I love God. I knew that... Um, uh, I'd go on a mission trip every now and then. I knew I'd get in a small group, and I knew uh, my relationships at church really mattered. I loved my pastor, but I basically didn't know where I really fit. And the closer I got to God, the more I felt kind of like what I was doing for a living didn't really have any matter, any like value except for making money to create maybe security financially or to have a balance sheet one day to say, oh, I'm going to do something great for God later. Um, but I'm here to tell you that God is using business people in the marketplace, and it's equally as important as the calling of God on a senior pastor's life. Because pastors can set vision, but business people set the pace of it. And you've got these two worlds that don't really play well together, don't know each other's real divine purpose, but my Bible says that we're created by God for God. And so once you give your life to Christ, you belong to him. And we're created by him, but we're created for him, and you got to know what that is. Or you're going to invest everything in your life, you're going to be doing things that really don't matter. And kind of, I think one of the disappointing things is that a lot of people are going to get to the end of their life, and they're going to look back and say, wow, man, that really doesn't matter. And my message today is going to be one, I'm going to be extremely candid, because uh, I think people need uh, the truth. I think now more than ever, people are longing for truth. They're longing for decisive leadership. Like, would somebody please be honest with me and tell me the truth? We need that in our political realm. Come on, somebody, right? We just need to know what the foundations are. It's like, well, you know where you're only going to get that is in God's word. Because if we truly believe we're created by him and for him, then he knows his creation. And he's hardwired us in certain ways to be spiritually gifted but we got to know what that lane is. You know, this weekend, I'm honored to, to be here for Legacy Sunday. We're doing Legacy Sunday at our church next week, and I serve as the legacy pastor at Church of the Highlands. And how I got there from business to church is at 50 years old, I spoke at Highlands, and we fell in love with it. But we fell in love with the fact that God spoke to us and said, you're supposed to be here. And it scared us to death. I was like, man, I ain't moving up Alabama, Birmingham. How about Vail or Beaver Creek? I'll move there, God, but I don't want to move. How about the Bahamas? I don't want to move to Birmingham. And God, it got stronger and stronger, and we started serving at that church. And, you know, who, who moves at 50 years old to volunteer at a church when you've been in business for 30 years? But we knew God was in it. And God took us on this journey of now where we're helping over 17,000 churches around the world where God's bringing business people and he's bringing pastors. And let me explain. Let me define business person. If you're not in full-time ministry at a church, you're in this bucket. Whether you're a student, whether you're retired, whether you work for someone, whether you own your own company, God has created you for kingdom purpose. He's created you for his purpose. And so what I mean by that, and I wrote a book about this called Stay in Your Lane, is every one of us have a divine lane to run our race you got to know what that lane is. Because in your God-given lane, you're going to find five things that I wrote about. And one of them is your purpose, if you're taking notes. You find your purpose only when you're in your God-given lane. It's what God created you to do. But then you also find your passion inside your God-given lane. And passion is the fuel for your soul. Passion is the thing that you get excited about. It's like when you got that job that you really loved. And you're sitting there working, and man, when you're doing it, it's actually feeding you. Number three is your provision is found in your lane. Every one of us need provision to get it done, and that's fuel for mission. So passion is fuel for soul. 
provision is fuel for the mission because it takes resources to get things done. Convoy of Hope, one of your partners, we partner with them in a big way. They're making a difference all over the world in disaster recovery and just being the hands and feet of Christ. And uh, what I love about them is the partnership that we have. You see, none of us are as good as all of us. And to be able to partner with that and take in resources and I don't think we're ever going to know the full magnitude this side of heaven, is when we invested in something that changed the, the geographical, changed the whole component generationally of a family that we helped. We helped one child that impacted a family that now impacts a generation. And I think all of us have purpose, passion, provision in our lane, but we also have pace. I'm 50 years, 58 now, I'll be 59 in a few months. And uh, it's different now. I got operated at a different pace. You know, I used to be able to be real fast. I was a runner in school, and I love to run. I can't do that anymore. I get winded going up two flights of steps. Yeah, I'm just operating at a different pace. But wisdom is, it's not a bad thing, but you got to know what your pace is. Because when the enemy comes in, he's going to sit there and say, okay, I may not be able to get you with certain old habits that you had, but I'm going to accelerate your life and get you on a treadmill. And I think that's where a lot of people are. On a treadmill, they don't know how to turn off. And they're going so fast and exhausting so much energy, and they're not really making any difference. As a matter of fact, what they're doing is they're, they're sabotaging their own life. And I think pace, though, we got to know what that healthy pace is. And then lastly is protection. And protection is how many of us want God's protection? Especially now over the last couple years when there's been a lot of crazy things going on in society and both in the health pandemic and everything. But to have God's protection not only over our lives, over our families, over those that we love, over our country. And then I added a new one just for today. A new P. I love doing things like that where you got all P's. So those were the five P's. Now I'm going to give you a sixth one. And the sixth P to knowing and staying in your lane and what you get in your lane is you find your place. And your place is important because your place is always going to include other people. Your place is never really about you, but it is about what God has on your life, and it is about this group, this spiritual family, and your place is a church. It's all part of the big C the local church. Many people I talk to, they say, Lee, you know, I'm looking at my lane and it's kind of inferior to other people's lane. And I tell them this, I said, don't see your lane as a limitation. See your lane as an invitation from the Lord because he created you for more purpose, more impact, and more fulfillment. But along the way when we're in our lane many times, and I've seen this over the last three years especially, is you've got to guard against road hazards. You know when you're driving down I-45 and they never stop finishing I-45? It's just like I, when I lived here in Sugar Land way long time ago, it was like a two-lane road. You had two lanes going each way, Galveston all the way, wherever it goes, Dallas or whatever. But it's two lanes. And you'd get down there because I'd have to go from the Galleria area to come visit my girlfriend, now my wife, in Friendswood. And it didn't matter what time of the day I had to go because I had to see my girl. And so I'm driving through there, and it's always been under construction. But I think that's us as the, as, as the body of Christ. We're all under construction. Look at your spouse and say, you're still under construction. Look at your other choice and say, I'm just praying for you. <laughs> but some of us take a wrong exit because we're looking at somebody else's lane and we veer out of our lane and we take a wrong exit of offense. Or we take a wrong exit and we allow other people in our lives to hitchhike the vision and purpose and dream that God's given us. You see, people don't mind you succeeding, but when God starts using you, people don't mind you succeeding, just not too much. And what happens is we've got to focus on what God has in front of us, not what anybody else that's trying to bring us down or trying to hold us back from fulfilling all that God has for us. The second half of my life, when I turned 50, I just sensed God say, give away your life of what you've lived and learned. And so now we're able to help all these churches and help business leaders around the world, but our return on investment is different now. When I was in business, I was in the financial tech business and also healthcare. 
We had owned long-term acute care hospitals and an institutional pharmacy, and we had thousands of lenders and retailers that used our financial technology. And uh, so did that for years. And I always looked at my ROI, which is return on investment. See, the kingdom of God, though, is different. God wants a return on what he invests, but the return is different. I call it E-R-O-I. It's an eternal return on investment. And because we need the church's best position to deal with the physical, but also the spiritual. So you saw that video of passing out water and helping people in villages and all of that. We need to do all of that. But at some point, we can't withhold the greatest gift of all, which is salvation through Jesus Christ. We got to bring both, guys. See, the government's not going to fix whatever's going on. Please understand that. And, but what happens is they may be able to, and people may be able to solve physical needs, but if you don't bring the spiritual component, you've not done anything. You've done something noble for a day, but it hasn't, it's not going to have any eternal impact. You know, in my life, people ask me a lot. They say, Lee, well, you and Laura have been generous. Um, why do you give? And I think when you don't know your why, you lose your way. I think when you don't know really the why behind it, you lose your way. And uh, so those of you, if you're taking notes, I'm going to give you the seven points of why I give. And I think it's going to resonate with you. That's my prayer, especially on Legacy Sunday. As we close the year out, my, my heart and my prayer for you is that you will live open-handed and open-hearted. There's nothing, I think, that has a breakthrough in life. Every business success I ever had, every single time, it came with before there was an act of generosity. I had to trust God in a moment of being generous, even with sometimes we didn't even have it. But I felt I had heard from God just to be super generous. And every single time, the backside of that, the fruit of that, was God blessed us tremendously. Now, number one is I give because the God I serve, he's a giver. God gives seed to the sower, not seed to the keeper. God gives seed to the sower, not even to the reaper. We know a lot of people who are successful, but their lives are miserable. There's carnage in their life where they built this dynasty, but they have no peace. They have no fulfillment. If one first gives himself to the Lord, all other giving is easy. I love that because I remember I try to bring myself back to the place where God did something amazing for me in my life. And uh, I, I think about generosity and I think about how uh, it really is the trade secret for my life. It's the trade secret. And some people say, oh, yeah, yeah, whatever. Well, you've never experienced real generosity or you'd understand what I'm talking about. And many people, they want to live their life where they're saying, you know what, um, uh, you know, go car, go ahead and take me to my destination and then I'll put gas in it later. Or how about you call the bank, call Wells Fargo and say, hey, bank, pay me some interest and then I'm going to make some deposits. And I think generosity is very much like that to where we're saying, you know, Lord, you've blessed me, but when I've given myself to you, and I know where you've taken me from and what you've empowered me to do, all other giving is easy. Number two, I love how I feel when I give. I think that nothing can change our attitude, nothing, or outlook better than generosity. Think about the times where you were generous and you blessed somebody and you just felt good about it. Maybe you gave a good tip at a restaurant, maybe, and it's just, there's something that we are hardwired by God when we're generous, it just brings a different out attitude, a different outlook. And by the way, I'm not talking about what you, with what you don't have. I'm talking about what you do have. God doesn't hold us accountable or even care. He's like, I'm not, I'm not looking through the lens of what you don't have. Son, I just know what's best for you and if you would trust me. But I love how I feel. The great Winston Churchill said this. He said, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. Number three, I give because I'm in covenant relationship with God and my church. And that simply means this, none of us are as good as all of us. So when you are in your lane, I'm in my lane, Harrison's in his, and Pastor Scott and Kelly are in theirs, we build a super highway, we get a whole lot more done for the kingdom. Number four, I really believe, I give because I really believe in the vision of our church. I truly believe, as Justin said in the video, the local church 
mobilized is the hope of the world. And it's when we all come together, and I think about, well, you know, people would say, well, Lee, you know, you've experienced financial success, so it's easy for you to talk about this. Well, you don't, you got to back the truck up 35 years. When that first business I started with a thousand bucks went from zero to 50 million and then out of business two years later and had zero. And starting completely over, eating some Vienna sausage and some peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, y'all. But starting completely over, and I could let that either define me or refine me. And then I said, Lord, you know, I remember praying, and I know none of you have ever prayed this kind of prayer, but I'm like, Lord, if you'll bless me one more time, I promise I'm not going to mess up again. (laughs) How many of you know you need both competence and character? Competence gets you in the door. Character will keep you there. And so I had competence, but I lacked in character. But God didn't leave me, didn't forsake me. Every dot that I connect, every moment, God doesn't waste anything. And so it started completely over, and uh, I remember praying, saying, Lord, bless me again, and I'm not going to blow it. And I could almost hear this chuckle, like audible chuckle of God. And uh, he's like, yeah, right, son. Um, How about you be faithful with the $50 you do have? And then don't worry about the $50 million. Just be faithful to what's in your hand. And I remember uh, my wife and I had $50 over our tithe. We believe that you return 10% of your gross income to the Lord. Uh, I'd rather my 90% be blessed than my 100% be not blessed. And so we're sitting there and and we're having this prayer time. And I'm like, I'm going to go meet with pastor and tell him we're going to give $50 a month over our tithe. We're going to change the world for Jesus with 50 bucks. And I remember how dumb that sounded. And uh, I met with my pastor, and I was kind of embarrassed and a little sheepish. And I said, Pastor, um, Laura and I really believe in God. We're going to change the world. And uh, we think we have the gift of generosity. So he leaned in a little bit. I think he got excited. I think he kind of moved up in his seat a little bit. And I said, we got 50 bucks we're giving over and above our tithe. He kind of sat back a little bit. And uh, I said, uh, I said, but we just want to start being faithful and let God bring the increase. See, you, our job is to be faithful in the pursuit of God and then trust him with the outcome. And so I'm on this journey, and so we start supporting two $25 gifts to two missions projects our church was involved in. And then the next month, we did it again, and we added a couple of more projects. We had a little bit of win in our sale and our business, and months and years later, we started giving more per project, $100, $200, $300 per project. The project started growing from 20 projects a month to 30 projects a month to 40 projects a month to 50 projects a month to 80 projects a month to 100 projects a month to 120 to 140 to 145 projects every single month through our church. And those dollar amounts started growing. And I remember putting a global, uh, you know, a big old map in our foyer as you walk through the hallway of our company. And uh, the company had grown and we had some more employees. And I could remember some of my unsaved employees from India or Nicaragua. They were like walking down the hallway and we never said what we did. We just had little colored dots on at the different places that we were funding projects. And they would walk by there and they would look and they... And my, and my Indian buddy, he goes, yeah, I'm looking right here. He goes, what is that right there? And he said it just about like that. And he said, and he goes, he goes, that's my home. And I'm like, yep. I said, we fund an anti-trafficking work that's going on there. He's like, wow, that's amazing. So it was like every deal we close, a portion of it's going to make a difference there. Like we stack up 145 checks every month. It started out as two checks for $25 each. And we're signing back, you young people, a check is a piece of paper with some, <laughs> but, but you got that check, and so we're writing these checks out, and we lay hands on these checks before they went out, and God was blessing. So I had my CFO, I said, go back, and how much, how much were we actually given? We weren't keeping track of it. We had given in that six-month period over $5 million, near six. See, and people say, wow, that's awesome. No, what was awesome was the $50 a month act of faith. That was what was awesome. That was, see, because it's not like, okay, 
God brings the increase. And so, but if I would have never, the test was being faithful with the 50 bucks. The test wasn't being faithful, honestly, as much when you've already done all of this stuff down the road. But God did a great work, which leads to number five. I give because it positions me for God's blessings and his protection. Everyone that's in this room, you know you want God's blessing and protection over your life. You see, the world of the generous, my Bible says, gets larger and larger. I have a Cajun paraphrase. I can't say it fully because the pastor would not ask me to come back. But I told my kids, I said, the world of the generous gets larger and larger, and the world of the stingy, it just stinks. It just ain't good. That's the Cajun paraphrase. And so, but I want my world larger and larger. Number six, I give because I want to be an example to my kids. Our kids don't follow what we say. They follow what we model. And I have my son here, and he can verify this. He and I, he and I were going to Detroit, Michigan. And if you've ever been to Detroit, that's the longest terminal. Like, it's like Gates, 1,187. I mean, it's just a long terminal. It's just straight. You're just going for days. And so we're walking by this restaurant, and it's one of our favorites as a family. And uh, you got P.F. Chang's here? All right. Well, we call P.F. Chang's in my house, Chang's. And so he walks by there, and he says, Dad, look, it's a Chang's. And I said, oh, man, let's go get some lunch at Chang's. And so we walk into Pff Chang's, and, uh, and the lady waits on us. And how many of you ever had a lady who's waited on you or a man, any waiter, a server, someone helping you, and there's a veneer smile, but behind it is pain. May have been in a restaurant, but hotel, may have been someone. This lady was doing an amazing job working her tail off, but she was, she was tired. She'd had a lot of pain. Single mom, growing kids, multiple jobs, working her tail off. And I looked at her, and I just sensed, man, we're going to bless her. We're going to bless her with a tip. And so I told Harrison, and Harrison goes, I said, Harrison, we're going to bless her like a tip, like a Fox News tip, and we're going to run out of here. And we're not, because it ain't about us. He goes, yeah, Dad, let's do that. And I was like, what you mean, we? I said, I'm the one doing it. You're the one participating in the blessing, but you're a spectator blessing. And so, <laughs> so he was, he was, so I, I write on the thing, and I write on the, uh, the ticket, and man, Jesus loves you, and just ran out. We're going down that terminal, about 100 yards down. Still got eight miles to go, about 100 yards down. And we're sitting there, and all of a sudden, Harrison looks back, and he says, oh, my God, Dad, here she comes. And so this lady is sprinting down the terminal, apron flying. Everything's, I mean, she's just like coming at me. She's twice my size, and she's like, oh, baby, you're going to give me a hug for that tip. And I'm like, whoo. I said, okay, <laughs> uh. And so she's coming in hot, and so we embrace, and I you just tell her, I said, you know what? I said, sweetie, I said, you deserved every penny. I said, God loves you, and he has not forgotten about you. You're a daughter of the king. She's crying. I'm crying. Harrison's hiding. <laughs> How many of you know, I give because I want to be an example to my kids. And then lastly, I give because one day, and this is the most important one, and this is what I've really came to share with you. If I could share any message, anything, one time, this would be it, what I'm going to share next. Because I think it is the most important time. We're entering the Advent season. Advent season's all about preparing for uh, celebrating Christmas, Christ's birth, but it's also preparing for his second coming. And I'm excited about that but I'm going to work my tail off before Jesus comes back. Like, I think work is a holy calling. I think good hard work is good for your soul. And, uh, but I give because one day I'm going to meet Jesus. And it's all about an eternal return on investment. See, he gives us salvation. And, but we're going to have two moments, not just the salvation moment, we're going to have two moments before the Lord. There's going to be two, not one. My pastor, Chris Hodges, taught me this about eight years ago, and it wrecked me. I called my old pastor back and wore him out. I said, you never told me about two moments. You just told me about the one. But there's two moments before the Lord, and I had to validate in the Scripture 
But the first moment's called the salvation moment. And you know what that is? That's the great white throne judgment. And all that is is God coming before you saying, what did you do with my son? Did you accept him as Lord and Savior or not? You get into heaven, if we did, and all of us hopefully, look, we, we proclaim as of our Lord and Savior. But it's a free gift. We don't do anything to get that. Ephesians 2.8 says, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It's a gift from God. And so if God's given us his free gift, we receive it. That's the salvation moment. You don't get to the second moment, which is a moment I didn't know about. The second moment until you pass the first moment. And that second moment, it's simply the judgment seat of Christ or the rewards moment. And that rewards moment's super important. And watch what scripture has to say, and I'm going to unpack this for you. And I think it's going to bless you. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all appear and be revealed as we are before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive his pay according to what he's done in the body, whether good or evil, considering what his purpose and motive have been and what he's achieved, been busy with, given himself and his attention to accomplishing. Watch this. This is after salvation. So we're in heaven. This is not a judgment like you're thinking, oh man, we're condemned or not. No, no, no. It's going to be like an Olympic competition. We're all going to be on Team Jesus with our new heavenly bodies. Come on, somebody. I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready for mine. These spanks are killing me. Come on. I'm just joking. Now, I know that was funny, y'all. So, <laughs> I don't know why I said that, but let me keep going. <laughs> the rewards judgment is not a judgment, but it's like an Olympic competition. Some people getting gold. Medals, some are getting silver, some are getting bronze, and some are just happy to be in the room. And wherever that stage of whatever is in, but it's a rewards moment. So I'm like, that's a competition. I was like, ain't nobody told me about that. I need to understand that. So watch in Scripture, Matthew 16, 27. It says, for the Son of Man is coming in his Father's glory with his angels. And then he will reward each person according to what they've done. Revelation twenty two twelve says it, I think, amazing. This is the end of the Bible. So it's like really important. It says, for we are co-workers in God's service. That's spiritual family. You are God's field, God's building. That's the local church. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. That's legacy. But each one should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it about. The day will bring it to light. And it's, notice it's a capital D. So that's, that's the judgment, that's, the, that's Christ's return. And then watch this. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, don't miss this. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it's been burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even as one only escaping through the flames. When I read that, it screamed out to me as saying, what survives? Like, what survives, God? And then it hit me. The question I need to be asking, and it's, I call it the E-R-O-I question. It's a powerful question. Is what I'm giving to going to show up in heaven? Is what I'm giving to my life, my influence, my time, my resources, is it really going to show up in heaven? Because I'm only going to be rewarded Watch this, for the things done in Jesus' name. Because that's what's going to survive. So let me give you a practical application. Your church has supported my wife and I's organization that we founded called Trafficking Hope 15 years ago. We have identified and rescued over 1,200 women in the United States out of the sex trade. Amen. <laughs> While that's noble, if none of them come to Christ, we lose. It was noble to do it, and you should do it. But if we end poverty, or we end sickness, if we end disease, and no one comes to Christ, 
in light of eternity, we lose. And so that was a massive, like major light bulb that goes on. You know, Billy Graham said this before he died. He said, a next great move of God is coming through business leaders in the marketplace. And I think God is raising up business people and he's messing with them. He's putting his finger on their heart. And all what they've been doing is not bringing the same fulfillment it once was. And God is purposely positioning them in place and saying, would you trust me to use you? To partner with what my work is in the body of Christ and let's come together and let's go take a lot of ground and impact and watch the rewards that show up in heaven. I think many times we're going to stand in heaven and I think some people are going to have an element, though they're celebrating, they're going to be like, wow, I missed that investment opportunity. And I think when we miss an investment opportunity, which I have several times, my father did, my father had the chance to partner up and get half of the United States territory for a company that it took 40 times to get it right, their product, and it was called WD-40, water displacement, the 40th time. My wife, Laura, her grandfather was an inventor he, right here in Houston. He and his buddy created a metal chest that his buddy took because he didn't think it was going to do anything, and he took it and later developed it further, and it became the Igloo Ice Chest. Not a bad company to do. And so he missed that opportunity. I think of Ronald Wayne, which probably maybe a handful of people in this room know who Ronald Wayne is, but you use his product every single day. And Ronald Wayne was, in 1976, was a business guy who sat there and was approached by two young entrepreneurs say, invest in my business. And so Ronald Wayne, who had wherewithal, he wasn't super wealthy, but he had something to lose. These other cats didn't have anything to lose. And so they convinced him, and he says, okay, I want 10% of the company, and I'm going to help you get the 15 grand you need to get this company started, 1976. Well, 12 days later, Ronald got cold feet. And he said, man, I'm the only one who has anything to lose. So he held back, and he was tight-fisted. And so he went to them, and these two guys were both named Steve, and he said, "Uh, I want y'all to buy me out. I'll sell my 10% interest for $800. So he sold that interest back, and what's amazing to me is he sold the interest back. But that company now today is worth $250 billion. His 10% is worth that. And it's Apple, because the two Steves were Wozniak and Jobs. I think that Ronald Wayne missed an investment opportunity. How many of us are going to be sitting before the Lord, and he's going to say, ooh, I missed that opportunity. I missed that opportunity. I think so much time we look at what we give to the Lord as an expense rather than an investment. And I think that mentality has to change, because God's saying, man, would you trust me? You're investing in me. And if anybody's been able to manage things well, it's been the one who created us. As I close and as we enter into Legacy Sunday and the Legacy Offering, I'm not here to sell you in anything. In my church, we don't ever ask people to give, but we unapologetically ask them to ask God what they should do and just simply be obedient to what God says. You've got pastors that have tremendous integrity and they lead this church in a way and steward the resources to make a difference. But this church needs a building, its own home. And God's gonna bring that about. And we're gonna look at that and see, because it's not about the building, it's about the life change. But God makes his appeal through us. He doesn't do it any other way. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, we are Christ's ambassadors. God's making his appeal through us. You know, Jesus-style generosity, I thought about this as I was coming here yesterday. Jesus-style generosity has no motive. Jesus-style generosity requires no justification. Jesus-style generosity needs no response. Jesus-style generosity just does because love does. Every one of you, bow your heads. Some of you are hearing today's message and you're sitting there going, you know what, Lee, I don't fully understand that. I've never really kind of reconciled my life with Jesus. You've never, ever, you're not even prepared for the first moment, much less the second one. 
That first moment is the most important moment. Maybe you were baptized as a young child. Maybe you were uh, exposed to the things of God, and, but you never really given your life to Jesus. Come on, guys. It's 2022. We're in December, about to close the year. What a great time to rectify that and reconcile your life with Jesus today. I'm going to lead those in a prayer, and we can handle that right now today. So no matter where you've come from, if you're far from God, if you've run from God, if you're uh, backslidden from God, if you, are, you, you, you thought you were saved but you know in your own heart you're not, I want you to simply raise up your hand right now. Raise up your hand. And, I'm gonna, and I just want to acknowledge it. Yes, I see your hands. Yes, you can put them down. I see your hands. Thank you. Thank you. Let's all, I want everyone speaking this together in this prayer, and I want us all to join in together. But those of you who lifted your hands, I want you to repeat after me the salvation prayer. Heavenly Father, come on, Heavenly Father, I give you my life today. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for dying on the cross and giving me forgiveness of all sin, past, present, and future. I commit my life to you today to be a student of your word, to profess your goodness that I'm going to be fearless, I'm going to be faithful, and I'm going to finish well in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. God bless you guys and Merry Christmas to you. Thank you for joining us. If you enjoyed this message, we want to encourage you to subscribe and to also share it on social media. You can always jump over to our website, myhighpointchurch.com. Click the giving link. What that does is it helps us to continue to share the message of Jesus Christ across the world. God bless you and remember, you can do all things through Christ.